Salah Hamwi heads up CARE's Yemen office. He is a Syrian refugee from Aleppo and a former professional basketball player. Welcome to the program, Salah. So for our viewers at home that may not be familiar with, with what is happening there on the ground in Yemen right now, give us some perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Piana. And I think you put it really right. The situation right now in Yemen is quite difficult. Despite that, recently we were able to secure around 1.2 billion in the recent blood for Yemen. It's, it's really little. It's less than 28 percent of what needed right now to meet the most urgent humanitarian needs on the ground in Yemen. Right now, I'm in Sana'a in, in, in Yemen. And, and the situation here in the country is extremely difficult. And particularly, we see the impact, the disproportionate impact on women and girls, uh, like taking its toll really as a result of this nine years of conflict right now in the country. That was when the Houthis there took over the government and the fighting sub began, obviously, largely aided by the Saudis. Um, Two-thirds of the population is in need of humanitarian aid. We mentioned that a fraction of what is needed is now being delivered. But how, how can you be sure or how can viewers be sure that the aid that is being delivered is going where it needs to be? I think the most important thing is like being able to rely on local resources. So, for example, here for Care International in Yemen, 99% of our team are Yemenis, are full Yemenis on, on the ground. So that allow us to have the access, allow us to understand the context, allow us to understand the undercausing uh, problem that we, we have in the conflict here in Yemen. Of course, in addition to the good partnership we have with the local communities, the communities that are participant into this response, as well as, of course, authorities and where we are able to operate, along with the cooperation and partnership we have with the peer organization, with the UN, and with the entire humanitarian structure in the country. There had been a six-month ceasefire, which uh, had ended in October. Um, an unofficial ceasefire continues today. I know negotiations are underway between the Saudis and Houthis. Is that giving anyone on the ground hope that perhaps they could see an end to this fighting and thus see more relief coming to the people who desperately need it? To like Yemenis. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you, yeah. During, during those six months in 2022, like Yemenis experienced for the first time in the last eight, nine years, they experienced the first time some hope that the conflict will end soon. And unfortunately, that truth was not extended. I know now there is a negotiation, and all Yemenis are hoping for an extension of that truth that become more permanent uh, to, to experience again the life they experienced during those six months last year. The U.N. Secretary General said that the international community has the power and the means to end the crisis in Yemen. Those are powerful words, but given the tragedies that, that continue to one after another, beginning with the, the war in Ukraine there and obviously the recent the terrible earthquake that struck Syria, I know where you're from and we're going to talk about your background in just a minute, but also Turkey, is there concern that some of the aid that could be going to Yemen is being sent to, to those other hard hit areas? Unfortunately, like Yemen is already in competing uh, conflicts in the world, right? In Syria and Turkey and Ukraine. So it is not new for Yemen. And Yemenis, of course, are very concerned about not being not being prioritized despite the needs, the desperate need we have right now on the ground. So that, of course, a concern you hear everywhere you go. And of course, I want to say here, like Yemenis, they don't want to receive aid forever. Like every conversation I have with a Yemeni colleague or or, or clients or like project participants from the community we're working with, they all want the aid and assistance just temporary until they are able to build the resiliency they need for to be for them to be self-resilient and hopefully in the future when there is more peace in Yemen. And this was no, by no means a, a prosperous, stable country even before the Houthis took over and this most recent uh, war began. Talk about what CARE does and what CARE has been doing, because I know you've been in the country, CARE has been in the country since 1993. Exactly, exactly. So it's been 30 years a country, which told you that the country already in need before the last eight, nine years conflict we have in the country. So for CARE, honestly, it was at different phases because of the situation in Yemen has been changing over the last 30 years from humanitarian to development response 
to being able to bridge humanitarian and development assistance. And right now, that's what we are trying to focus on, on how we are able to deploy the humanitarian assistance for the long run, for the long term response. So what we are doing right now is a combination of work on water, sanitation and hygiene, working on education and youth empowerment, um, livelihood, food security, and women economic empowerment in, in, in Yemen. If anyone knows what life is like in a war-torn country, that is you. Uh, as we said, you grew up in Aleppo. You played basketball for the Syrian team there. Obviously, when the war broke out and started, you left for Turkey. Tell us a little bit about your, your life right now and, and ultimately what led you to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, honestly, surprisingly, like, I think Yemen gave me more than I give to Yemen. In a way, it's become a home. It's been my home for the, almost the last year. Um, everyone here, um, when they learn I'm from Syria, like despite that they are living, the living condition is really so difficult with the current conflict. And yet they told me like, we are glad you are here. We hear Syria is difficult right now. So imagine um, the generosity of the people in Yemen and Yemen itself. So Yemen in, in a way has been, has given me um, a home for, for, for the last year. Um, on, in terms of like my transition, yeah, so like before, before the conflict, 12 years before the conflict in Syria, I used to play basketball professionally. I'm from Aleppo, second largest city in Syria, city that is really rich in history, in culture, in diversity. And uh, like in just in a matter of few days, we found ourselves in, in a conflict. And that, you know, we know that's a reality and we know that everything that we take for granted in terms of our safety and in terms of our living condition could just change just like that, right? Particularly could be days, could be hours, could be second, like what happened in the earthquake in Turkey and Syria recently. Um, our life, it's all changed and same as of every other Syrians, my life completely changed. And I found myself naturally trying to find the ways of how I could help fellow Syrian and Aleppo, particularly supporting and very displaced people in Syria, which are right now around 7 million people. 7 million Syrians are in very displaced. We talk about Syria as refugees, but we don't, we don't talk about Syrians who are in very displaced there and who also need our support and attention. Um, and, and from that, I found that the conscious experience that's being being connected to, you know, we as a human, we always try to find a way to connect to others. Could be race, could be language, could be culture. And also I found in my case could be the suffering, could be the, act, the conscious experience of displacement, could be all of that. And I found myself working with care in Turkey on the largest, on, uh, and, and on the refugee response in Turkey. Turkey hosts largest number of refugees worldwide. And then from that, I found myself working as well on, on Yemen, uh, where again, like it's been one year right now, and it really feel people here, again, despite not having anything, trying their best to make me feel home. And all my fellow colleagues here in Yemen, are their, case, their story is not like different than mine. Mine is not that much really unique. Every aid worker who is from the Middle East right now, they were not prepared to be an aid worker in their education or in their when they look at what they want to do in the future. Everyone is right now, like it's been naturally shift in their, in, their, in their career, in their job. Most of my colleagues here are doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, translators, drivers, farmers, business owners. Um, so my case to be honest with you, it's not that much unique. It's almost the story of every aid worker from this region. Well, you've become a voice for not only your colleagues there that um, selflessly are giving so much of their time to help those people in aid, but, but a voice really for, for the people on the ground there. Uh, having gone through what you experienced in Syria yourself, you know firsthand what life is like for them. And um, I'm just inspired by your optimism that uh, better days will be ahead and we need more voices like yours to be sending the world the message that aid needs to be delivered now so that their lives can improve and hopefully make the world a better place. Sally Hamwe, thank you for what you're doing and thank you for taking the time to talk to us from what a country it appears, uh, just your adopted country right there. You have so much passion for it. We appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Piano.